The program originally scheduled for this time is unavailable for broadcast. The following is presented as a substitute. To market with real pigs. Ever seen a little baby while it was still a fetus? Ever wonder what frogs have to go through just to grow up? Three, two, one. Contact is the secret, is the moment. When everything happens, contact is the answer, is the reason. Why everything happens, contact. Let's make contact. This show is about growth and decay and sex and seeds. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. Everything on this show started from a seed. <laughs> it's rated PG. Pretty good. <laughs> Funny. What are you planting, Mark? Seeds, maple seeds. You're going to grow a huge maple tree right here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I've got bigger pots. You know what's really amazing? Inside these little seeds, there's a whole little plant just waiting to grow. Inside every seed, there's a baby plant, a tiny embryo that will start growing when the seed is planted. This movie speeds up the growth of a peanut plant and a pea plant. corn come from? Your crazy Uncle Harry's market? No. Well, it did, yeah. but it didn't. That's what I like about Mark. Always full of straight answers. <laughs> what I mean is, it did come from my crazy Uncle Harry's market, but before that, it came from a seed. That's what a kernel of corn is, a corn seed. I'm Gene Baker, and welcome to Baker's Acres. I'd like to have you meet my son, Dennis. Hi, Mark. And my son, Robert. How do you do? Good, good. What's Baker's Acres? Baker's Acres, well, that's our family farm corporation. And we grow corn and soybeans, and we also raise swine. Is this the same corn that you feed to your pigs? Uh, yes, except that... Uh, the corn we feed to our pigs has been dried artificially, and you see it's taken off the cob. How does it grow? Well, when we plant this seed approximately the first week in May, we have to have good soil, sunlight, and moisture. That seed will represent this stalk, and the kernels are formed through a process of pollination. Mm -hmm. And this, these tassels on here, there's one for each kernel, that is the female part of the corn. There's one of these tassels right here for every kernel? For every kernel. Here. Now, the male is the tassel on the top of the corn, and the pollen, which is the male sperm, so to speak, fertilizes each one of these kernels through the cells. So one of these kernels represents a stalk, this big stalk here. Plus this ear corn. Plus this Sometimes ear of corn. two ears of corn. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. And this is the male part, and it fertilizes this, which is the female part. part. Yes. 
which helps to develop each kernel along right. the cob. That part did not get fertilized. Uh-huh. Is there any particular reason why up top it doesn't get fertilized? The, it might have been too tight, not enough air or something. And there's different factors involved. Mm -hmm. I'll throw a little thing out for you. You will not find an ear of corn with an uneven number of rows on it. This way around? Right. Okay, I'll start here. One, two, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He's right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Pigs reproduce in sort of the same way as corn, except, of course, that the male and female pigs are two separate individuals. The male and female mate. The male fertilizes the female, and about 15 weeks later, the babies are born. <laughs> How old are they? They're 24 hours old. The sow moved into the stall two days ago. Mm -hmm. She had her pigs yesterday. They're a little uncoordinated yet, yeah. stagger around and aren't sure of their footing. Right. But they still have the ability to, to get up there and, and get some mama's milk. So they can see pretty good when they... Oh, yes. The first one. Yes. It seems like they hit the ground hungry, and, and mm -hmm. first, first instinct is to get around and, and get some of that milk. Yeah. You may not have known this, but pigs establish a pecking order starting almost at birth. What does that mean? Well, that means that the, the biggest, strongest pig will try to nurse off the forward portion of the sow's udder because that portion gives more milk. As we move down the udder, often the very smallest pig ends up at the rear portion of the, the udder. They're beautiful. Well, a little ornery. Uh, they aren't aggressive. They they can nip you. They have very sharp teeth. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is a little gilt. That doesn't hurt. No, this is how we hold little pigs. Really? That's how you carry pigs from place to place. Uh, unfortunately, you can only do it till they get so big, and, yeah. and, and size is a factor. But we do mark uh, the little pigs as uh, future females to go back into the herd. Mark. I'm talking to my crazy Uncle Harry's frog, Garth. Oh, I'll get the net. You call a funny frog. Hey, you know, this frog knows jokes, too. Hey, Garth, where does that road go to? It doesn't go anywhere. They just leave it there for cars to go on. <laughs> uh, didn't you think that was funny? No. no. You know, I was always brought up to believe that frogs couldn't talk. Well, then you should sue your parents. Of course they can talk. And not only that. They don't begin life as tiny versions of what you see here. And what do they start out as, straight men? And how long have you been into ventriloquism? Ventriloquism? Throwing your voice? Not me. This is a talking frog, and a smart talking frog to boot, not just one of your run-of-the-mill talking frogs. Smart, huh? Okay. Ask him where he comes from. Dallas, Texas! You know what she means. It's a long story. Interesting, but long. When you see a frog, you have to be very quiet so they won't pay attention to you. When they're not looking at you, you have a chance to catch them. They feel slimy, but if you're careful and gentle with them, you won't hurt them. And they won't get nervous. Frogs lay their eggs in the water. The eggs are only half an inch small, though. It's round, and it has this big bump inside it. Then the back starts forming, and then you can barely see a polywog. They start to move around so they can break out of the egg. After a few weeks, they hatch, and they're so teeny, they're about one inch long. They can swim everywhere like crazy. There's all different kinds of polywogs, like land frogs and tree frogs and green frogs. They all grow the same way. Some of them turn into frogs right after they hatch. Some of them wait for three years. 
The back legs come out first by the base of the tail. After the back legs come out, the front legs come out on the side through a little hole. The eyes start moving from the side of the head up to the top of the head. His mouth gets bigger as he gets older. They didn't have any legs when they were tadpoles. They just had a tail. When they grew legs, the tail started shrinking. Finally, the polywog is completely turned into a frog. If the eyes never grew up to his head, he wouldn't be able to see on top of the uh, well, I'm coming actually to find out exactly how old the baby is when I will be delivering. And I guess every mother, it crosses her mind. When you start to stretch and get really big, you wonder if there's maybe more than one in there. So just to make sure that you, if, well, anyway, to know whether or not I'm going to have twins or just one baby. Do you think you're going to have twins? Uh, sometimes when I get kicked out from both sides at once, then I think <laughs> I am. Hi. How are you? My name is Dr. Weissman. Hi, Lynn? I'm Linda. Right. Uh, okay. My name is Jamie. How do you do? Lynn, why don't you come right around here and just step right up on there and sit down on this stretcher. Have you ever had an ultrasound study before? No, I've never had anything like this. Well, it's a very simple test, and I'll explain it to you as we go along. Okay. Okay? Why don't you just lie down for me? Okay. Doctor, before you start, can you explain what ultrasound is? Well, what we're doing is we're applying this special microphone onto the mother's abdomen, her stomach. And this machine will convert the sound waves into an image that we can see on the screen. The sound waves turn into a picture? Right. It's something similar to what dolphins do when they swim or bats do when they fly in the dark. When a bat wants to fly in the dark, he'll send out a sound wave and the sound wave will bounce back at him as an echo from an object. And by analyzing the echo that comes back at him, he can see where the object is and how far away it is so that he won't bump into it when he gets near it. Can the baby hear the sound when you put it up against the, the, her stomach? Well, firstly, we don't call it a baby yet. We call it a fetus. Why? Why isn't it a baby? The reason we don't call it a baby yet is because it can't survive outside of the mother until it's nine months old. Can the fetus hear the sound when you put that up against her stomach? Well, you tell me if you, if you can hear it, okay? I've just turned the machine on. And this is a special microphone that we use. You have it on? It's on right now. But I don't hear anything at all. That's right. Remember I said we're using sound waves beyond the range of normal hearing. What I'm going to do now is put some jelly on the top of this transducer and also on your abdomen. And that will provide a nice surface for me to be able to just roll the transducer back and forth and also let the sound waves go directly into your abdomen to see the fetus. We don't see very much when we hold it in the air, but let's see what we see when we put a fetus underneath it. No. Ah, what's no. that? Oh, I oh, can see that. Oh, the, yeah, moving around. Yeah. Here's the, the it fetus's like heart it's going beating. so fast. Oh, he moves. He's moving. Right. Oh. Oops. Is there that a baby? Oh, I saw it on there. It was kicked. Oh, that was a strong one. It sure was. <laughs> see? It's headed 88 millimeters. Uh -huh. And how do you determine the baby's age by that? And I can look up and see that 88 millimeters is actually 38 weeks. So that means I only have two weeks left? <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's why your obstetrician sent you in thinking you may have twins, because you're bigger than he expected for your dates. You're actually two weeks before delivery. Oh, oh my goodness. Better go home and pack your bag. I know. I didn't even get it ready yet. <laughs> and a few more pushes, and you should be able to push this baby right out. I can hold my baby. This woman is giving birth. About two good pushes, and you can have the baby. Okay, push. Push. 
That's it, yeah. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Okay, relax now, relax. Everything. You push and hold it there. I think you can have that baby now. Okay, the baby's out, Don. All the work is over. Let me see. Okay. That's a beautiful sound. Right. One twenty two. It's faster. One twenty two. Now my cousins will know he's dead. If you don't come back with a boy so I can teach this dress, boy, I'll be mad with you. Shabam Pabin D. Okay, you guys, grow. Mark, will you leave those seeds alone? Yeah, they'll grow without you punching them around. Okay, okay. It's just hard to believe that such great big living things start so small. You and start even smaller, remember? About the size of the point of a pin. I know. It's also incredible. And if you think it's incredible, how do you think the Bloodhound Gang feels? I don't know. I never felt the Bloodhound Gang. Big animals and little animals. Some of the biggest animals on Earth are here, and some of the smallest. Some are fed by the truckload, others by the teaspoon. But this lady has to make sure every animal has the right amount of food. She's Liz Russo, doctor of veterinary medicine, here at the Bronx Zoo in New York. When I first light. got here, yeah, I could hardly believe that anyone so young could be a real animal doctor. But as I went with her on her rounds, I realized that she's totally comfortable in this world. She knows about every animal we came in contact with. And she really cares. They seem to know it. And they trust her. This is our brooder room where the baby birds are taken care of by Jean. Jean, this is Lisa. Hi. So you take care of feeding all the little birds? Yes, I do. And some birds eat fruit, so we cut up little pieces of banana and grape yeah. and uh, make a little fruit. Those are really tiny pieces. What are those for? Those are for the pitter, uh, the fairy bluebird, which just hatched two days ago. The younger the bird, the smaller the um, piece he gets? Right. Yeah, you can't give a bird a piece that's too large, otherwise it can't swallow it. If the larger the mouth gets, then we can make the pieces larger. Yeah. Until eventually, when they're adults, some of these birds can eat whole mice or whole rats. How often do you feed them? Most of the birds get fed about every two hours. So you really have to be careful with them? Yes. Make sure we, you feed them. We constantly watch their weights. To take care of an animal this big, you need Bill Liggett. He's Tuss's keeper and trainer. How much do the elephants eat? 300 pounds in a day. And 300 pounds? Yeah. What? And the two little guys, they're eating about 150 pounds a piece a day. I Is this guess. all they eat? No, in the evenings, we give them some fruits and vegetables as well, carrots and apples. Yeah. And then in the morning, they get a breakfast treat of uh, some grain. Say ya. Uh. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Admit it. You were doing the frog's voice. OK, OK. I was pretending the frog could talk. Everybody knows. Frogs can't talk. talk. what they think. 321 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. It's a game show. It's a geography lesson. It's a mystery. It's the search for Carmen Sandiego, and it continues today at 4.30. Now stick around for Square One TV.